Welcome back to Disturbed Reality. Before starting, a quick trigger warning. The details of this case are extremely harrowing and graphic. In fact, it's one of the worst true crime cases in which I've come across. That being, the brutal murder of Gabrielle Kahn by his friend, Daniel Petrie. The internet is filled with content that depicts some of the worst goings on in the world, both in the past and during the current day, whether it's footage from ongoing wars, terrorist executions, or murders committed by criminal organisations, the discussion is to be had in regards to the effect that this content has on the individual viewer's mental health. Although such content is a mainstay on my channel, the discussion is also to be had in relation to whether there is any moral justification for such content being available here on the surface web, and whether it can have any positive impact whatsoever. The argument against real online violent content is a real one, whether some of us like it or not. I personally believe that there is a place for it, providing it is covered in the appropriate manner. Regardless, some would go a step further and question the effect of fictitious media such as violent movies and video games, some arguing that they have a detrimental impact on young consumers. Since the turn of the millennium, video games such as Grand Theft Auto and Manhunt have been named in high-profile cases of murder and violence as the inspirations for such crimes. For example, the murder of Stefan Pekira in the UK, which occurred in 2004. The young 14-year-old boy was killed by his 17-year-old friend, Warren LeBlanc. He was lured into a park where he was killed due to several stab wounds and being bludgeoned by a hammer. Stefan's mother, Giselle, claimed that her son's killer, Warren, mimicked a game by the name of Manhunt. Miss Pekira said, I heard some of Warren's friends say that he was obsessed by this game. To quote from the website that promotes it, it calls it a psychological experience, not a game, and it encourages brutal killing. If he was obsessed by it, it could well be that the boundaries for him became quite hazy. The reality is, however, isolated incidents aside, gaming is a healthy hobby for the vast majority who partake in it. It's a way to unwind, disconnect from reality, and relax, and even a place for socialisation due to the rise of online gaming. However, this wasn't the case for Daniel Petrie. But who is Daniel, and what transpired on that harrowing day of the 23rd of July, 2007? Daniel Petrie, who was 16 years old at the time, and Gabriel Kuhn, who was 12 years old, grew up in Blumenau, Brazil. They lived a stone's throw away from one another. Daniel Petri, throughout his childhood, always had a disruptive and aggressive manner, so much so that he skipped numerous school classes, as well as getting into conflicts when he was at school, much to the dismay of his mother. Daniel's mother, worried about her son's declining mental health and lack of social development, she booked Daniel to see a psychiatrist in which he did attend, though after a few sessions, Daniel refused to attend any further, preferring the sanctuary of his room where he would spend hours without speaking to his family. Daniel was a player of the role-playing game Tibia. In fact, he was obsessed, playing daily for hours on end. While playing Tibia, Daniel would play with others from all over the world, though Gabriel would become one of his closest online friends. The two would speak for hours on end during their long gaming sessions. In fact, they became so close that they shared personal details and experiences with each other. This is when the boys realised, purely by coincidence, that they lived in the same area of Brazil in Blumenau. After months of talking online, the two eventually would see each other personally, Daniel would regularly visit Gabriel at his home to play video games. Gabriel's mother, although letting Daniel play with Gabriel, didn't fully trust Daniel at first. She found his personality and mannerisms odd, and was concerned with the age gap. Though, 
As time progressed, she put her initial distrust of Daniel to one side. Her son Gabriel seemed to enjoy his company, so she let the friendship continue. In fact, she even let Daniel visit unsupervised after a period of time. And little did she know, she was letting a monster into her home. Like many online games, the game Tibia featured an online currency called Tibia Coins. They could be used to buy things such as cosmetic skins in-game. During one of their long play sessions, Gabriel asked Daniel for 20,000 Tibia Coins, which he promised to pay back. At the time, that equated to just $1.75. Daniel, trusting Gabriel to pay the coins back, lent Gabriel the 20,000. As the days passed, Daniel started to ask when he would get his 20,000 coins back. Gabriel seemed non-committal in his responses. Eventually, Gabriel blocked Daniel on the game and on all other social media. This enraged Daniel, so much so that he would pay Gabriel a visit at his home. A couple of days before the murder, Daniel dialed Gabriel's family home number. In doing so, his mother answered. She explained to Daniel that she would be out of town and that her son would be home alone if they wanted to play, unaware of the boys falling out. Little did she know, she had sealed young Gabriel's fate. On the 23rd of July, 2007, Daniel went to Gabriel's house and knocked on the door. Upon no answer, he tried to enter, but it was locked. Daniel kept on knocking, and eventually, Gabriel spoke to him through the door. Daniel instructed Gabriel to unlock the door and let him in, and that if he apologised to him, then everything would be fine. Believing this, Gabriel unlocked the door and let Daniel in. After entering the house, Daniel locked the door behind him. Daniel then battered Gabriel. He cruelly assaulted him. Gabriel tried his best to defend himself. However, he failed to do so. Daniel was older, bigger, and stronger. Gabriel was dripping in blood after being terribly beaten by Daniel. Daniel then began to laugh at the terrified Gabriel. He then took Gabriel to a bedroom and either reared him or lost him. Gabriel screamed and cried, but that only made Daniel Petri more cruel. The essay was so severe that the bedsheets were stained with Gabriel's blood. Once the beating and essay was over, Gabriel then threatened Daniel that he would tell his mother what happened, which further enraged Daniel. In a fit of rage, Daniel unplugged a games console, he took the cord and then wrapped it around Gabriel's neck and strangled him until he went limp. Daniel assumed that Gabriel was dead. Believing that Gabriel was dead, Daniel tried to move and hide the body in a crawl space in the hallway leading to the bedrooms. However, the body was too heavy. In realising this, Daniel searched the house for sharp tools, and eventually, he found a kitchen knife and a hacksaw. Daniel returned to Gabriel's lifeless body, and in order to make Gabriel's body lighter, he would take the hacksaw and knife and start cutting Gabriel at the top of his right leg to remove it. As Daniel cut into Gabriel's leg, he woke up. Gabriel wasn't dead. He let out a blood-curdling scream, though Daniel restrained him as he continued, making sure to twist and turn the blade to make it even more painful. Eventually, Daniel dismembered Gabriel's right leg and then moved on to his left. After severing both legs, Gabriel passed away. His autopsy suggested that he was still alive throughout the entire ordeal, eventually dying due to shock and blood loss. Once Daniel had finished the dismemberment, Daniel, once again trying to hide the body, wrapped a cable and wire around Gabriel's body in order to try and hoist it into the attic above, but to no avail, Gabriel was still too heavy. Daniel then fled the house. The dismembered body of Gabriel was later discovered by his brother. 
The body was left by the hallway trapdoor and the legs in the hallway next to the hacksaw. Soon after, Daniel was arrested by police. He admitted all the details of the crime without hesitation or remorse. Astonishing police were the amount of detail of every action and feeling he had while recounting his afternoon with Gabriel. He remained remarkably calm during police interviews, only getting angry and screaming once, denying any claims of yeah. But medical examiners had conclusively proven that Gabriel had been solved multiple times. Disturbingly, Daniel Petri was admitted to a juvenile delinquency centre to be sentenced in September of 2007 to only three years of socio-educational punishment. This is due to Brazilian laws surrounding the sentencing of minors, which essentially means he was released in 2010, free to continue his life, despite brutally snuffing out Gabriel's. Since his release, Daniel's whereabouts or any details regarding his current situation are unknown. To put Daniel's evil and psychotic nature into perspective, when asked by the judge if he had any last words of remorse or apologies for his actions to Gabriel's family, Daniel replied with the following, Gabriel was a coward and a thief. He burns in hell right now where I sent him, and when I die, I will find him in hell and finish my revenge. That statement, in my opinion, perfectly summarises the evil incarnate, which is Daniel Petri. It's also worth noting that there are several crime scene photos for this case floating around online. How these photos surfaced onto the internet is unknown. Potentially, they were leaked by authorities similar to the Three Guys One Hammer case in Ukraine. I certainly wouldn't recommend searching for these pictures online, they are extremely graphic and amongst the worst crime scene photos that I've ever come across. Ultimately, this case is just tragic and honestly, one of the most depressing that I've covered on this channel. I can't even begin to imagine the pain that young Gabriel went through that day or the pain that his family has suffered since. It, it doesn't really bear thinking about. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video if you can enjoy this sort of content. I'd also like to thank you guys for all of the support that you have shown me since I started this channel in only May of last year. Uh, the last couple of weeks we've had a big increase in subscribers and more views. Maybe the YouTube algorithm is helping me out, but ultimately it's down to you guys because you keep on interacting, you keep on smashing that like, and you keep on showing that support, and yeah, Honestly, the last couple of weeks have been somewhat overwhelming. I still feel like I'm a I'm an infiltrator in this whole YouTube scene, you know? There's, there's channels out there with much better editing, much better narrations, but for whatever reason, you guys choose to support this channel. And for that, I am eternally grateful. So thank you guys very much. And as always, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the next one.